<laughs> All right, everybody. I believe we are good to go. Um, I want to welcome everybody to our sixth webinar, Drop Shotting 101. And we appreciate everybody for coming on. We do want to first apologize to everybody. We're running a brand new system, and that was for the delay from uh, last month, not getting this webinar out. But this should be a much better format. Uh, but a lot of people, I'm sure, had to download new apps and all that kind of good stuff to be able to get on today. So uh, hopefully this thing will run a little more fluent after this. But again, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Drop Shotting 101. I'm Josh Douglas, and my good buddy and Bassmaster Elite Series Pro, Seth Fighter. What up? Um, all right, I'm going to go through a couple quick basics right away um, about this, just so you know. Again, we urge questions. We love questions. Keep the questions coming. Matter of fact, we have a prize package for anyone who logs in live and asks a question, gets a uh, put into a drawing yeah, to be able to pretty good ride. stuff going on yeah and it should get better and better as we keep doing these um should be able to keep getting some some really nice prizes coming in uh to ask questions you can see here here's the arrow showing the q a um free can they see my mouse when i move it like this perfect okay so you can see right here we're gonna push q a and that'll answer the quest ask the question here's where you can type it in and submit it and we'll address every single question we possibly can at the end of these. We like to keep them going. We love the questions. Yep. Bring them. Uh, we have a webcam. This is a new thing. It was by popular demand. A lot of people wanted to see our faces. So you got us. There we are. Um, so basically, you can move this thing around. You can make it different sizes um, to do that. You see here. Different different ways that you can actually change these in from minimizing and getting rid of it altogether, making it small, or moving it around throughout your screen. This is from a, like a computer. Uh, you can actually m minimize it, remove it all together. If you're finding that that our mugs are getting in the way of your the screenshots and stuff, you can just get rid of it altogether if you'd like. Uh, this is from uh, smartphones and your smartphones. You can see I don't believe you can move the screen around. Um, but here's where you ask for the Q and A's is right down here. This is where you ask your questions and same deal up in the right hand side for any iPad users. That's where you can ask your questions at. Um, and then there you go. Uh, you can leave, you can either get rid of it all together or leave it up. Is that correct? Right? Yep. So on, uh, on the iPad, you can either get rid of the the video altogether, video feed of Seth and I, or you can get rid of it altogether. I don't believe, though, you can move it around. I've heard maybe you can under different phone sources, but I don't know that to be true. On my iPhone, you can't. All right. Prize packs. This is the prize pack we'll be giving away. We'll let somebody, we'll let it, we'll announce who the winner is at the next webinar. And uh, we'll have more on that coming up. But we'd like to thank Rapala, BioVex, Pelican Products, and Ocast Tackle for their donations for this prize pack. Uh, keep them coming. Then we appreciate it. All right. Let's get down to it, huh? Yeah. We got through all the important stuff. Now we'll get to the really good stuff. Breaking down the drop shot. Basics of the drop shot. Want to give it to him? Yeah. Uh, this is a real basic slide here, just for any of you that doesn't know what drop shotting is. Um, going through here, basically, uh, you tie your hook, leave a long drop leader, attach it to a weight, a little different rig than um, any Texas rig or Carolina rig like that. Uh, we got our braided main line, leader knot. We'll go through all this stuff later, but it's just a quick rundown if anybody had the question, what is a drop shot? This is your basic stuff. Uh, straight floral versus braid. We're going to get right down into it, try to break down everything we possibly can today about drop shot applications. Uh, this is a big one. And for me, I've gone almost fully to, if not fully, to the braid and floral combo. Uh, there's a lot of good reason for this. You? Yeah, Cindy? I'm almost straight braided line while with the floral leader. Now, um, one advantage, real super cold weather. We do a little fishing up here on a warm water discharge and we'll be fishing in, you know, temperatures less than air temperatures less than thirty some degrees. That's where floral really shines for me anyways, just the braid, uh the water tends to freeze to the line. Cold water. And uh and before I used to like for dropping vertically on fish, 
fluorocarbon comes after real a lot nicer than braid does. Braid kind of tends to stick. But uh, now I've been tying such long leaders that uh, I'm still using braid with a floral leader. Um, and another thing, there's a lot of good app. There's a lot of good reasons why you'd actually want to use the the braid to floral. Uh, line twist is going to be a big yeah. one when you're vertical dropping and doing a lot of that stuff. You tend to get a lot of twist if you're going straight floral. Um, you're not going to get that. You're also going to minimize your stretch by using braid. Uh, especially you can use a lighter rod too, something that'll really bow up on that fish. Uh, castability, you're not going to get, you know, you have better castability. And another thing we should talk about too, and we'll get to it a little bit, is your reel size is going to play an important factor. But you can get on a big drift on, on drop shot, and that braid will really come in key when you're, when you got a fish way, you know, way out there, and you got to try to set the hook from far. You're going to really like them, no stretch attributes. But then with the floral, you still get the, uh, you know, the close to invisible underneath the water and all that yeah. kind of good stuff with it. Kind of present it naturally to them. The FG knot. Yeah. Uh, there, I, I'll still tie a modified Albright or Alberto, whatever you want to call it. But uh, I'm definitely leaning more towards the FG knot. Now that I've been tying it more, it's by far the strongest um, braid to floral knot there is. It's close to 100%, if not 100%. Um, it is a little time consuming and takes a while to get used to, but it's like anything, the more you do it, the, the easier it is, but it, it's definitely the best knot out there. But the fact we're using light line and stuff, you're never really putting a ton of pressure on fish. You can still get by using that modified Albright or Alberto knot. Um, but this is what we're tying now. It's definitely the strongest one. Yeah. And that FG knot, it's, it is, it is tougher to tie, uh, but it's, it's long and it's, it's, uh, very slim. So you can put it in your reel no problem I, I never have any problem with the catching or anything it'll come right out of there uh and and the best part about it kind of works like a chinese <clears throat> finger trap or yeah. whatever you have it where you're not actually what what is it? you're not actually bending the braid yeah that, that's what makes it 100 percent. is there's no crease in your floral carbon where you have with any other um braid to floral knot your floral carbon actually just stays in a straight strand the whole time so it is 100% not, and uh, we're not going to go over how to tie it. If you want to know how to tie it, look it up on YouTube. It's it's going to take a while and a little practice, but I guess that's what winter's for. You can sit in front of the TV or the computer and just tie a bunch of knots. And like I said, once you do it a bunch, it's, it's pretty simple. Different types of drop shot weights. Uh, there's a lot of them. You can start with tungsten or lead. Um, I, I'm going to say you don't you don't need tungsten all the time. I use tungsten. Um, as much as I as I possibly can, uh, but at the same time, it, uh, lead is definitely a good option. You're just going to get a little bit more feel and stuff when you're using tungsten. Uh, you can feel your bottom changes and stuff like that a lot differently. So, you know, more so, I guess, if you're going to be dragging it around, casting it and stuff, and you want to really feel certain kind of areas, then you, you might want to definitely go to tungsten. Uh, but I guess it's more if, if your budget fits tungsten, I, I would use tungsten. If, if that that'd be my yeah. advice. Yeah. Yeah. As, as far as different sizes, what's your favorite size? Um, I'm sorry, not sizes, uh, types of. Well, I, I use both. Um, the cylinder style is what I typically use for most of my smallmouth fishing. Um, this, the ball style shines in a couple places. I really like it for bed fishing just because that sinker does get caught up a little more than a cylinder style will. And usually in a bed, there's something a little stick or a little bit of rock where you can kind of get that sinker wedged up against against it and keep your bait in the same place and another thing it's nice if you do any we'll go into it later but if you do any flip shotting or you're pitching under docks or around wood and stuff um just making that underhand pitch with a drop shot is kind of a problem to begin with because you're trying to throw up you know maybe a 12 inch bait essentially between your uh, hook and your weight so that uh that round ball shortens up your sinker a little bit it's a little easier for pitching under docks and like i said i like it for uh, bed fishing just because i can get it to hang up a little better but um day in and day out most of your drop shot and will be uh i'll use a um, cylinder style sinker yeah no doubt about it. you get around zebra mussels and stuff like that and you can really go through the weights in a really quick hurry and uh um the the cylinder one for me just seems to come through them through them a lot yeah. better uh i think you get a lot of just where the bottom of the weight kind of drags across the bottom and stuff and keeps that knot up you know that your your uh, drop line away from the zebra muscles and really helps leader length 
This is a big one. Yeah, a lot of emails a lot about of leader questions link. about leader link, and it's big time important. Um, you know, it all depends on what you're doing when you're out there, and and uh, you know what the fish, what kind of mood the fish are in. If you can just drop it down to them and they're just jumping all over something, you can go with a shorter leader. But I've definitely seen too where uh, I need to let it sit there for a long time, and and a longer leader will help you do that. Generally, when I'm bed fishing, I go with the shorter leader, pretty pretty short Real actually, short. in the inches, you know. Something I just wanted to get down there. I wanted to stay. I don't, I don't want the bait to be. I want all control over it. Uh, the longer your leader is, the less actual control you have over your bait a little bit. But it'll give it more of that uh, weightless presentation that everyone knows has been deadly for a long time. Um, what are some instances you like to use different? Um, typically, most of my smallmouth fishing, I'm going to run a long leader. And, uh, and then bed fishing, or if you're trying to flip it around, tight cover a shorter leader works a lot better bed fish and i just want my bait to look like it's almost on the bottom it, it gets a better reaction out of the fish so typically then i'm fishing a three four inch leader um and then smallmouth fishing i might be fishing up to a two two and a half foot leader depending on you know a lot of them places we go to they got a lot of perch grass and stuff um then i run a long leader just because it's basically the bottom but your sinker is going to go into it so it's nice to keep that above it um but yeah, mostly smallmouth fishing. I'm running a pretty long leader, and largemouth fishing or bed fishing. I'm typically running a shorter leader. And one thing to note too on leader length, um, I, I agree with Seth completely about, especially smallmouth stuff. I like that long, a little bit longer. They like leader. to come up. They do. It, one exception though, and I don't know if you do, at uh, Great Lakes fishing, they're so goby orientated, and those gobies straight are up and down. They don't have an air bladder or something like it. So they just jump up and down off the bottom. And, and sometimes them shorter is a lot more realistic looking to them. Uh, that would be about my exception. And a lot of time that is, you know, what, what are you looking at as far, you know, a perch and kind of sit there and hover over the bottom a little bit or a goby more jumps up and down. So you kind of want to know what, where you're fishing and what your forage is that you're looking for. But for the most part, them longer leaders seem to do a little bit better. Yeah, you get a little more control. Of it. Plus you're fishing with a little bit of slack in your line. So that leader length doesn't necessarily translate how far your bait is off the bottom. I mean, um, with a proper amount of slack that you're going to need for shaking your bait anyways, even with a, say a two foot leader, your bait might only be a foot off the bottom. And you're hopping that weight up and that's kind of a no, no. Sometimes you don't want to do a lot of people when they first get into drop shot and two, they just don't have the confidence. They want to yeah, give it too much too movement or it's not a Texas rig. It's not a jig. You know, a lot of times the less you do with the drop shot, the better it's going to perform yeah. for you. The, the key is keeping that sinker on. You don't want to be lifting that sinker up and down off the bottom. You just want to shake the slack in your line, giving your bait a lot of action without moving it, moving the sinker uh, further away from the fish. Popular drop shot baits. These are the goodies here, no doubt about it. Um, want to break them down? We'll yeah, we're going to go through a little rig in here too. Um, I know we got another slide coming up on hooks, but – Essentially, the two types of hooks I use for drop shotting, one's a small straight shank. It's a VMC. They call it a flipping hook, light wire flipping hook, but it's a straight shank hook with a keeper on it. Um, and then you have your nose hook type hooks. You know, um, I use a VMC Sure Set. There's a, there's a bunch of them on the market, but your smaller hooks, those are typically used for nose hooking baits. Um, I'll, I'll use them in smaller baits. If I can get away with that straight shank, I will. Um, like here on this swim bait, we got it threaded on. Um, it's a little different. A lot of guys aren't doing that, but that's a great way to be able to utilize that hook. It's just a better landing percentage with a bigger hook. Um, so I'll, I'll actually thread bigger baits on there. But when you get into these smaller baits, these two and a half, three inch baits, nose hooking is pretty much your only option or wacky rig. And that's when I'll go with that, uh, that sure set type hook. Um, but pretty basic stuff here. We got a robo worm. Everybody knows about that. A new uh, bait from Daiwa, Nico Worm, great worm, got a ton of action. Um, swim baits, I love drop shotting them for small mouse. Um, wacky Senko, that's a that's a pretty standard issue drop shot bait for me. A lot of basically for large mouse fishing with a spinning rod, I'm uh, gonna throw that four inch Senko or a six seven inch straight tail worm. And then small mouse, I do a few more things a lot with the swim baits. This little Erie Darter's a killer bait, cross tail, super popular bait. We got some BioVex baits, the Colt stick, and the fishtail. And then uh, for flip shot, and we're actually going to use a big flipping hook here. This is more like a heavy cover grass flipping in the weeds. 
It's actually a straight Twitch, shank yeah. flip and hook with a Daiwa Rattling tube hog. And there's so many bait. I mean, you yeah, you, you, could, you could drop shot drop any shot. bait you want. Literally but, uh, almost anything you want. Uh, that's how you find out what, what's going on. But these are some of Seth and I's bread and butters that yeah, we use across the, the class. These are the ones that I have to make sure I got my boat at all times uh, when I go and drop shot. Uh, okay, we're going to try to break this down as best we can because there's a drop shot's a drop shot, but at the end of the day, there's different different ways and different ways you're going to present a drop shot. Uh, the first one is going to be casting and drifting. Not technically the same thing, but the same kind of genre. Uh, drifting, you're going to use, you're going to drift a lot when you're on the Great Lakes or when you're fishing in real windy conditions and you, you can present it. And it's ideal when you're, when you're fishing big, expansive areas where those fish kind of line up through the whole thing. I mean, you can catch a drift or cast around on that reef until all of a sudden, bam, you, you catch one. And then you start making that same that same cast in there, uh, but either way, you're still casting away from the boat, and you're keeping the you're keeping the bait out away from the boat as you're presenting it along. Yeah, that's something you want to play with too on the Great Lakes. I've definitely seen days where you'll catch all your fish casting and just working the bait, and days where you'll get all your bites like dragging it behind the boat, drifting it. So definitely something you want to mix it up on on the Great Lakes. Um, that's about the only time I'll really drift a drop shot, but, uh, the structure is so massive out there. It's a really good, good way to cover a lot of ground out there. And, and also for tournament fishermen or, or partners when you're out there fishing with somebody, pay attention to what the other guy's doing. They're sort of catching. I mean, they're in a place more, uh, is there any other kind of fishing where you can really tell a lot by what the other guy's doing in that situation? I know I've definitely had a guy in the back of the boat beat me up this kind of fishing before, and maybe I was casting and he was drifting in just a simple change like that, uh, or he was just dragging around the back of the boat. Sometimes that can be so deadly. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you just cast it way out there, and all of a sudden you go to check your line, and they're on. And I can't tell you how many times last year. Yeah, yeah that's you'll that's get a lot of bites that way, drop shot and um, throwing it out there. And when you tighten down to start working it, uh, you'll have a fish on it already. Uh, reef fishing, here's just a screenshot uh, from my Lawrence. I think this is somewhere eerie-ish, something like it. Uh, just big glacier reefs, areas that you you know, you just you either have specific spots where you're going to start making the cast, whether it's in like these little, you know, these little rock piles are sitting inside this, this glacier drop right here, or whether you're actually – taking the whole edge of it or going right down the center of it, just letting the wind. I mean, sometimes you don't have a choice in the matter. I mean, if the wind's bad enough and the waves are bad enough, you, you're you not sitting in it because you could do more damage trying to hold your trolling motor in one spot. If you're only in 8, 10 feet, they can hear you. You know, they can definitely hear your trolling motor sloshing in and out. Uh, it can get old. So drifting might be your only way to catch them. And that sometimes, you know, again – but then you don't ever count on it because the second you count on drifting, you'll get a one mile an hour wind the next day and you ain't going anywhere. So uh, then you go more towards that cast, cast and drag, I guess, cast it out there and kind of drag it back. The spot drop. I got a bunch of emails about this. Uh, a lot of people want to know a lot about it. And all my, uh, all, a lot of my electronics training I do, it's, it's a question I swear get, it gets asked every single time I want a video game fish. I want to drop down and see a fish and drop down and catch them. So whether you're actually spotting them on the graph and dropping down or you're just vertical dropping under the boat, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, there are some key differences. Um, I can rest assure you I, I don't ever use down scan, structure scan while I'm actually looking for fish like that. I might look for their home with it. You know, I'm finding me a big, nice-looking rock pile. But um, that's not something that I'm doing. I'm not using it in front of it. I'm using sonar, traditional yeah, sonar. That's where your 2D sonar really shines. And you can see a difference here. Um, in it, I mean, you see them both. One was driving over. The other one, you can actually start seeing the arcs over this rock pile right here. And you can see the fish stacking on top of it. That screams a drop shot to me right away. It's about a perfect drop shot scenario. You get right over the top of that and just start dropping down though. All right, here's here's how the actual video game fishing works. This is a fish. I've used this clip before. I think I was on Oneida or somewhere. I'm not sure where it was. But I had a solo fish. You can see him right here. Um, as the screen progresses this way, you can actually see my line fall down to the fish. I actually, you're seeing my line come back up is what you're going to end up seeing. So if you can follow me here. Yeah, I I came down, and I lost the fish momentarily, picked it back up. Here it is. And the fish actually bit the bait somewhere right in here. 
But as I set the hook, you can see where right here is where I lifted that fish up. As I set the hook, I had him on for about a real revolution, and then he came off. And this is now him going back down to the bottom, and you see where I caught him again, or I tried to come back on him, and this is my line reeling back up. So and I, uh, it's winter. I would have loved to get out there and got you like the actual – um, and I got some other screens to kind of show you, but here you can see where the line is coming back up. And a lot of times you can see it. I mean, you'll see like an arc, you know, up here and you'll drop down and you'll see the fish just start to drop down towards it. And you'll see those connect. And when you really get dialed into them, you can almost set the hook as soon as it looks about right to you on the screen, like that fish has got it or where it disappears and they, they take it down uh, even before you actually feel the fish down there. But you can absolutely see them. One of the biggest things I want to say for everybody is don't just get discouraged if you're under 20 feet and you're not seeing uh, it come up and, and you're not seeing your weight and your bait drop. That's, it's so common. And if you have any kind of wind at all, it's going to make it tougher because you're, you're, blown, you're, you're getting blown away from your cone that you're originally looking at. So sometimes you just got to drop it down there knowing that that fish was right about where you saw it reaching over and dropping just letting that bait sit as your boat moves away and stripping off line until you can feel it but when you got the conditions and you're able to stay over the top of them man it's a really fun way to fish definitely yeah, yeah if you're if you're less than 13 for 13 or 14 feet of water you're gonna have trouble uh seeing your bait go down the deeper you are the easier it is to see it i mean the cone just gets bigger um so yeah and just try to drop it right on the trolling motor is one thing i always do um you drop it a few feet up to the side you're not going to pick that up so literally drop it right on top of that troll horse so you know yeah. it's dropping right down in there you can watch it go down the whole way if you do it right and size of your weight well there's tungsten lead and then what bait you're using too will help you see i mean if you're using a really small thin bait it's not as much for that that thing to pick up as if you got a bigger bait going down but no none of the matter you can be using you know a really small bait and uh 30 feet of water and you, and you have the right conditions, you should be able to see it on the bottom. As far as settings go, um, generally I use a lot, and I'm going to get into that a little more, but I use a lot of factory settings. Just recently did I start changing it. I, we've talked about this before in our webinars. There's a lot of things I do change when it comes to my electronics, but as far as Lowrance goes, um, I really like a lot of their factory settings, but I'll break down that a little more. In this image right here, uh, you can see there's no fish in this port. There's no fish here, but you are actually seeing this top line right here is my bait and the bottom line is my weight. And all I'm doing is jigging it up and down off the bottom of it, off the bottom of the, the water underneath my transducer. So that's it. You know, it's showing here's the weight. Here's my bait. I'm moving it up and down. And sometimes, you know, you'll drop it down. The fish may be here and you actually lift it up to them. And then they'll, you'll, you'll feel them. You'll see your line go slack, meaning they picked it up and they have it now. So that that's kind of, what you're looking for obviously you can't really see what your bait looks like per se in the fish uh, but a little bit of playing in the right conditions and you can see here this is 12 feet and it was picking me up but we'll get into that why that is um marking fish you can tell a lot when you mark a fish these are all marked fish there's looks like two of them there's one on the bottom uh this one was coming to the bottom going coming from the top going to the bottom I mean, these are all fish. If there's nothing underneath them, it's a fish. It's drawing me back an echo. I can see them. I can see that they're good fish. The colors inside them matter a lot as long as you're dialed in correctly. But really, you can tell their moods. I, you know, I, these ones were actually spotted bass. These are, are uh, smallmouth in these pictures right here. And it's so common. Uh, spotted bass t like to show themselves to you. They like to come up and check out the boat and go back down. Um, you know, and a lot of it, whether that's a drop shot fish or not, you're going to drop down there and see what happens. They might want to come up. And that's a lot of times when you just learn the more time you spend looking at your graph and actually looking at the fish, you'll start to kind of actually understand which ones are in the right mood and which ones aren't in the right mood, you know, whether they're sitting on the rocks. And a big one, we didn't bring it up too much here, but we've talked about it in the past, is uh, a hydro wave is a good thing to get. Sometimes these fish get hugging to the bottom. Maybe they're not in the mood, they're not nothing, and I can't see them as good. I swear that hydro wave sometimes will get them to at least do like this, right here. Just get off the bottom just a little bit. You know, get, get a foot off the bottom, look around, just get curious. Something where I can see you there, then at least I know I'm around fish. and I, I tend to slow down a little bit more and start catching them. Yep.
ping speed. Uh, this is this one's a big one. I haven't never touched on these in the webinars before. Um, I've still been kind of playing with it a lot myself. I've used this at you know when I know I got a big drop shot derby coming up. Um, I'll use a ping speed. Now here, here's the deal with Lorance. I believe they come custom set to 17 or 20. Um, I think 17. And then when you're, if I'm actually moving and I'm looking for them and I'm sitting on the council of my boat, driving around looking for fish using sonar, I'll crank my ping speed up a little bit. That allows the pings to start pinging faster uh, from my sonar. So the sonar pings the bottom and you want it to ping fast so that I'm not missing nothing. If it's going at its normal rate, as I'm going along, I could miss them. But if I increase it, now at the flip side, when I am under 30 feet or less, which is a lot of fishing. I mean, that's a good quality chunk of all of our fishing is yeah. 30 feet or less. 90% uh, at least. Drop down your ping speed and you got to play <clears> with it. You know, everything you got to kind of tune into what the fish are doing, what you're doing, what depth you're at. There's a lot of variables, but if you tune it down about 25%, so say it's at 17, drop it down to like 14. And what it'll do is this, it'll uh, start showing you them, them echoes in more detail longer start making them bigger and longer it'll make your bait jump out to you more now only time i'm going to do this though is when i'm on my trolling motor and i'm trolling motoring around i'm looking for fish underneath me you know i know i'm catching a good percentage of my fish actually visually seeing them on the bottom that's when i'm gonna start to do that but if you start getting around grass and stuff like that just run factory settings I mean, you you start messing it up. You know, you start messing up a lot if you're around grass and stuff like that. But if you're fishing your glacier reefs, small mall stuff, or even places like Amistad that's real deep, but there ain't a lot of grass, you can you can dumb down that ping speed a little bit. And it'll actually help you. Now, mind you, this is on your bow mount only that you would want to do that on because that's where you're doing all your damage. You're sitting up on the front of your deck staring at that grass. The flip shot. Um, you give them the main flip shot deal before I get into this part of it, because this is kind of a mega flip shot deal. It's kind of an asterisk around the flip shot. Okay. Um, <clears throat> doing this with a bait caster, heavy line, fairly heavy line, 15 to 20 pound test, depending on the cover, maybe a little lighter, maybe 12. I'm um, doing this a lot, bed fishing, large mouse, um, fishing around boat docks, fishing lay downs, fishing vegetation, a lot of stuff, uh, like we flip a lot of grass back home this flip shot's been starting to play doing that flipping a uh, really thick mill foil um it's just just drop shot in general is just a really good way to catch a lot of fish fish that aren't going to bite other types of baits they're not going to bite that texas rig or that jig that's in there you can put it in their face and keep shaking it until they bite it um a little bit different most of our drop shot is done with a spinning rod and light line this is not that technique um this is going in fishing some really heavy cover that people typically don't drop shot and uh it's been producing a lot of really nice fish for us over the last few years not the best search <clears throat> bait though no, no definitely not you you, you got to know they're there you got to know they're there uh, a couple examples i've been to some real clear lakes spring and you can actually like if you get up close see the fish in the lay downs but they're not really actively eating a jig or a tube or anything like that and uh going back and hitting them with the flip shot and just keeping it right in their face uh it's going to get you a lot more bites. It's definitely not covering water. You know they're there. You know there's a school of fish there, a few fish living in there, and you're uh, um, picking off the ones that don't really want to bite. Right on. And we'll get into kind of – it is a little bit different, you know, the rods and stuff that you want to use for that, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, what I want to touch on on the flip shot is the um, – this is kind of an idea, I, I would say, when I'm – using a flip shot, I'm 85% of the time, I'm using what Seth was just talking about. Um, however, I have been very successful on certain lakes, certain big fish lakes, um, fishing, fishing a, like a flippers uh, setup. You know, I'm talking a, a mega flipping stick, 70 pound braid, a big hook, a beaver and a big weight. And what, what I was doing was fishing foundations. You can see these are a couple of the fish I caught. This is in South Texas. Um, or you just need big, big rods. I mean, you're talking about big fish and, and I got sick of breaking off football jigs and Carolina rigs every other cast. Um, I was fishing foundations. I knew the fish were there and here's some of them, you know, the, the foundational work where it's still kind of got like that edge, you know, it might only come up three feet in some areas and six feet in the other where the original foundation for that house was before they flooded it out. And 
what we found is we could get right over the top of them and just drop that down. But a, we couldn't use a spinning rod and we would have broke them all off. But uh, we remember fishing in South Texas where you need big equipment to do a big job. And uh, it, it worked better than anything we could have. It was one of the best trips of my life. And that's where just something a little different. Now I've came home and used that on Lake Minnetonka, a little bit on some rocks and some other places I've used it. Uh, kind of a, you know, it ain't your traditional drop shot, but man, they still like that weightless presentation when you can get over the top of them. You feel the lightest little tick and then you set the hook and here up comes a nine pounder. You know, it's, it's pretty awesome. So that's one thing we should talk about too. Like drop shot gets a reputation and maybe it's getting better these days. It's kind of a, sissy way to fish or doesn't catch big ones or whatever i have caught some of the biggest fish in my life on a drop shot and i, I don't think anybody can argue the small mall factor but no. big fish get get big for a reason they're really really smart you know they see a lot of football they see a lot of typical baits that sometimes when they're in that right mood the drop shots will get the job done uh bed fishing bed fishing is another one we talked about this in our small mouth one i mean it's a great i use it for largemouth and small mouth uh, a lot of times, depending on their mood, sometimes I use, you know, something else to get them all excited and then throw the drop shot on and they're on it right away. Uh, but you see it a lot. Anybody who spends a lot of time bed fishing, uh, they chase the minnows away constantly. I mean, that's just what they're doing. They're constantly chasing away. So you get the right kind of bait in their face. You can see I talked about this a lot, the BioVex bait, the IU, the Colt tail. Uh, I can see it for forever away. It's like using a white bait. And there's just something about the way it is. They just don't think twice and they eat it. And, and honestly, I land a whole bunch of them on the drop shot too. Like it seems like when they take it, I, I, they're coming into the boat, you know, uh, they, they kind of commit suicide on the hook is what they end up doing. And they're not, and that's the thing when you're bed fishing, sometimes they don't want to bite the bait. They're just trying to move it. They don't want to eat it. Yeah. They're trying to move it. So you got a little bait and hook and you're going to catch that fish. You know, they don't feel nothing. Uh, here you can see same deal. Here was the bed. And there was the bait drop down to the bed, a drop shot, and up comes your fish. We've talked about this a lot. Um, anyone who hasn't seen, anyone wants more information on that, we talked about in our small mouth one, pretty substantial. Setups. Okay. Um, basically, most of my drop shot is done with a couple spinning rods. Um, I use a little bit different setup for I shouldn't really necessarily say small mouth versus large mouth setup. This more has to do with the hook I'm using. Anytime I'm using that small sure set hook, and most small mouth fishing's done open water, deep water, um, a lot more vertical than most of my large mouth fishing's done. Um, I can get by with a lot lighter rod. I'm using lighter line, a smaller hook. Um, I'll use that Daiwa Steez seven foot medium light, where uh, with We'll call it my large mouth setup. I'm using uh, that little straight shank hook. I get I get by with a little stiffer rod, and typically when I'm fishing large mouth, I'm around some sort of cover, brush piles, docks, grass, something like that. I'll step it up a little bit to a, a seven foot medium action. Rod, reels are basically identical. Lines basically identical. I'm running ten pound eight thirty two suffix braided line, uh, high vis lime green. Uh, I like it because I can see it, and I'm tying a leader to it, so it doesn't really matter. And then uh, for flip shot, and that's a little different deal. It's more your power technique. I'm using a eight foot heavy action Daiwa rod and a seven three gear ratio Daiwa reel. Um, and then we're using anywhere from twelve to twenty pound fluorocarbon for me with a big flipping hook. I do a lot of largemouth bed fishing this way, and uh, just any time you're fishing really crazy cover, thick grass. Uh, thick wood stuff like that where you really got to haul them out it's kind of a a beefed up drop shot setup right on let's get into your hooks okay i've gone over this but these are basically the two hooks i'm using for drop shot and uh the sure sets like a small ones any any smaller baits i'm using i'm nose hooking or wacky rigging i'm going to use this little sure set and then any bigger bait that i can weedless rig or uh thread the bait on like i showed you with that swim bait i'm using this uh this straight shank flipping hook just a uh, better landing percentage i can put a lot more pressure on the fish um just a higher percentage deal that's another key thing to that uh that softer rod with those nose hook style hooks that sure set um you will have some fish pull off just the way that um they're hooked like that straight shank hook almost 99 percent of the times will rough them and punch it through there's pretty much no way they can come off. But the problem with those little nose type hooks, 
you'll actually get them hooked like flat, like on the top of their mouth where they're actually just attached to a real small piece of skin. It's not actually punctured through their mouth. Um, and that's where your lighter action rod and backing off on that drag is more of an open water deal for me. Just letting them fish swim and not pulling that hard on them. Uh, I can almost land every single one of them. Yep. <clears throat> Talk about my setup. So ours are going to be very similar. I mean, I can't lie. We basically rigged a bunch of poles and we each wanted them all. So we had to split them up. So um, here I'm using a Daiwa Steez. <clears throat> 701 that's my spinning rod i use this a lot for like my a robo worm a lot of my largemouth type fishing when i'm around grass uh, i'm using a daiwa exist 3012 i really like that reel daiwa's got a whole bunch of spinning reels you can use i happen to like that one because i've grown up using uh spinning reels my, my whole life i'm very very familiar with them and i just feel like i have more control over the fish and i don't leave it up to the reel entirely the reel allows me to do that um, my small mall setup is a Daiwa Steez 701, uh, medium light, fast action. I'm using the Daiwa Steez, uh, reel on that one, a 3012. We talked about it a little bit. Our reel sizes are bigger. Um, a lot of, I get it, the 2500 size or whatever, you know, that's where I think everyone starts. You always think you want small and finesse, but I mean, this reel is so light. Uh, all of them are in their line, uh, just cause it's a, it's got that size spool doesn't mean the whole body is like the traditional three four thousand size reels that people were used to uh, but you have so many different things that that reel will do for you uh, one cast a lot further with that bigger spool you can pick up a line a lot quicker when you get a, a cast and, and the bigger that it swoops around like that on its rotation the less line twist it's going to have for even when you are using your straight floral application which I mean, there's, you know, Aaron Martin's one of the best drop shotters out there. I know he uses a lot of just straight floral. So there's obviously, there's, there's guys that, that, that do it more and there's a time and a place and, uh, um, that, that bigger reel spool will help. Uh, uh I'm going to take the flip shot side of it with that heavier one. Uh, I use exact same presentation except a right-handed reel than what Seth just had on before for any of my regular flip shotting. But in the case of, um, the heavier flip shot that I was talking about, uh, I got the Daiwa Zillion, the high-speed Daiwa Zillion, the 7 to 3. Uh, I'm using the Daiwa Steez flip and stick, 8 footer. It's all good. And uh, I like the Daiwa Samurai braid for it. It's a vertical presentation as if I was flipping. Uh, same type of deal, real limp line. Uh, just gets the job done real good. And if you look down here, when it comes to my spinning, spinning setups, you know, I really like uh, – I use Daiwa J braid, uh, 8 or 10-pound test. 10-pound test is what I've been using uh it's a great line again i can see it really well and then my leader i use either a seager tattoo or seager and vizx um floral carbon and my hooks are a little different on my on my flip shot i do use a vmc flipping hook i love that hook um i like it for my flipping too i just it's a good hook and then i also use uh I, i'm a big fan of the rebarb hook that uh, air marks up design um, for when I'm like Texas rigging my uh, drop shots. And then I really like that new G finesse hook by Gamagatsu. It's a new one. It's one I played with all last year. It had a lot of success. Uh, it doesn't have the same shiny finish that some of the other ones, uh, the nickel plated ones that people are used to. And it is sticky sharp, man. I tell you, you will, you will get yourself at that hook numerous times all today. But uh, that works real well for me. Exactly in the same, all the same situation Seth was talking about before. Um, I just tend to, those are the baits that I use, and so it works well. When, on your flip shot, you know, uh, with those fish that I was catching, I was actually using a beaver. That was the one that I, that was what I was using. I've had success with a multitude of different things. Uh, just all kind of depends. Yeah, that's, that's it. All right. Uh, I've had a few changes to my website. Um, I got my website all up to date. It's joshdougasfishing.com. Now every single one of our webinars are stored in there. And you'll be able to, uh, any of these, we, we um, you know, of course, we load these all on YouTube, and that's where literally thousands of people watch them, and that's great. We also want to keep people coming into the live feeds, and we appreciate those that come in, and we're going to start really cranking up, like I said, our prize packages, start getting people to come on live. Uh, plus the questions part. I mean, that's the best part. We're, we leave this thing open. It's now your show. You guys tell us what you want, and we're going to go through it, and we're going to tell you, put us on the spot. You, you want to hear the things? ask us 
So, but, but still, anyone who wants to see any of the webinars, please visit my site. You can see right here. You can go down and visit the webinar session, and check them all out. Our next webinar, we are actually getting ready to go fishing. And it, <laughs> it doesn't even feel like winter in Minnesota yet. It's starting to. And uh, our boat should be here relatively soon. And we'll be headed down to Florida. But we are going to fit in another one before we go. And I am really excited about this. We got special guests. Have, we do. We got Eric Ass coming on from uh, Swimbait Universe. Uh, we are doing everything Swimbait. Yeah. Everything. And me and Josh, we're real familiar with the the paddle style, boot tails, whatever you want to call them, what most people are fishing. But uh, Eric Ask, he's definitely around these parts the king of the the big hard baits, the big glide baits, um, stuff I know people got a lot of questions on. So we brought him to answer the tough ones and uh, go through some of the real big stuff, and we'll take care of the, you know, your Kitek type baits and your uh, swim baits, stuff like that. And it's kind of nice. We get around Eric. We shut up and we listen. Yeah. We get to hear him talk. He knows the stuff. So it should be a good one. us a lot about him. Uh, Swimbait Universe, awesome group there. You want Swimbait information, so it should be a real good one. We're going to talk from spinning poles and really little tiny swim baits to the big glide baits, man. We're going to go over them all, line presentations, what you want to use, and we'll have Eric in here too. So it should be, should be a good one. That's on January 5th at 8 p.m. again. Uh, we hope to see you guys there. And again, we want to thank these companies for their support. They, uh, anybody, I mean, please, you can get your name up here, your logo, anybody who shares uh, that this webinar is going on. These things are free. It's for the fishermen, by fishermen, the whole nine. Uh, Bass East, Bass Utopia, and Dr. Sonar uh, sharing our stuff just to share it, man. We really do appreciate that because it helps out a ton. And Navionics, of, of course, Navionics is essentially sponsors this deal. I mean, they, they're the ones that gives us give us the stage for us to do our thing, and um, we really do appreciate that. Um, uh, we want to thank you all for attending. Uh, get on the mailing list, and, and of course, uh, this is an open seminar, open webinar. Get in touch with us at any time. We'll answer any questions you have. Yeah. Let us know what your ideas are for the next webinar, what you thought about us, if Seth should get his tooth fixed, anything. <laughs> bring it. Uh -huh. Just whatever you got for us, bring that looks it. good. All right, let's get to some questions, huh? I think it's time. Let me see. I got to figure out how we do this first. All right. Hover over the green one. Uh -oh. We're having a little difficulty, guys, and bear with us. We're trying to operations. It's got to be in there. Oh. Got more? Oh. I did, it's right here. Look at the chat. Look at the chat. There we go. This ain't the q and a. What happened to your tooth, bro? And this is the... Uh, we broke it a few times. Guys, I think... Um, let me think here. How can we come up... For some reason, again, this is a new format. We really apologize, but our question and answer part went down and there's a little bit of growing pains with this new one as we learn this deal as there was with our first one under the other format uh yeah there should be a chat feature i don't know where the chat feature is but anybody who's asked questions through this we can't we can't see any of them where's the chat function That's my favorite part. Yeah, this is the best part Hold on, guys. Bear with us real quick. We're going to put you guys on mute real quick while we figure this deal out. Please stay with us. We're going to figure out a way to get these questions so we can see them. All right, y'all, we're back. All right, um, we're going to have to make do with what we have. For those that are still on want to ask questions, there's a chat feature. 
I'm trying to find where it is. It shows me here if you guys can see this, but I believe you guys have a chat somewhere up in this neck of the woods that should. There's one right there. What tournament are you most excited about next year? Um, probably Lake Cayuga in New York. I went there. That's right. I went there and messed around a little bit last year. Um, it's a lot like my home lake, Minnetonka. It's going to be a grass flipping deal. Uh, by far my favorite thing to do. So I'm just going to pick up a you know three quarter ounce outcast jig, put it on some braid, and drop it all over in that grass. And uh, Malax, if I make it there, that that should be a fun one. I spent a lot of time fishing there. Uh, for me, man, I'm really looking forward to Florida. I love Florida. Florida doesn't always love oh, me. Yeah. I don't know what the deal is there, but I love going there. It's cold, so, man. Yeah, I'm gonna. She is. I mean, I just I love it. But uh, big time. I'm looking forward to those Northern Opens. Uh, Oneida, Champlain. Those are two that I really expect to do well at. I've done well to James in the past. So the Northerns are really. I'm looking my chops for. Um, and the Centrals, man. I got a new one on there. I can't never say it. Echelada. A Chafalaya. A Chafalaya. He's, he's crushed me every single time. I've never been able to say it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to go there. Here's good. <clears throat> and the Red and Arkansas. But definitely those northern venues. And Douglas. Douglas should be kind of cool, too. Yeah. Going back to Tennessee. I do love me some Tennessee. Let's see. Right. People are getting out. Here we go. We're now. starting to roll. Let me. Oh, another thing I wanted to say I forgot to talk about. Um, the knot I prefer to tie when drop shotting, especially with light fluorocarbon instead of a polymer, which is what most people tie most of the time, is actually a San Diego jam. You can look it up. It's it's basically like the first fishing knot you ever learn. It's basically a clinch knot, but your line's doubled up, so you end up with three tag ends. Um, nice part about that knot when you're using really light fluorocarbon and you tie a polymer knot, uh, especially with a big sinker. I use a half ounce sinker a lot for smallmouth fishing. Um, that knot will actually go through the eye of your hook and uh, puts a little damage on your line, and you know you're pulling on the bottom of your hook too, and you're doing that. So it might not seem like a big deal, and if you're using 20-pound test, it isn't. But even the lightest snake in six-pound test is pretty detrimental. You know, you're you're down to probably four-pound test at that point. Um, so San Diego jam actually prevents your knot from going through there, uh, which is a good little tip. Definitely. Let me try to get back up here. Let me do this. Go bigger screen. To here. All right. Where are we at? Mm, what happened to my tooth? Well, <laughs> I broke it when I was like 10. And then last year at St. Clair, I tried ripping open a bag of plastic worms and it went flying off. And then I got a fix. I tried biting through some 20 pound fluorocarbon and it broke. And then I got it fixed. And then I was eating a sub sandwich with a hoagie bun. I was and, there, and they broke on that somehow. A gas station, and I just I, yeah, I haven't got it fixed since. So uh, somebody said something about the angler of the year on Malak, Seth. It's got to be a big one for you. Yeah, that's gonna be uh, gotta qualify, right? Yeah, definitely got to make it to that one. Um, if it's anything like it was this fall, it's gonna show off pretty good. I mean, it's only a three day tournament, but. I would have to assume at least 75 pounds to win, maybe more. Good to have one in Minnesota, too. Yeah, I mean, we oh, got yeah. a lot of bad fish sure. up there. I think they're starting to see that on the oh, national yeah. that, level. And right now, Mille Lacs, I've, I've been all over the country. It is the number one smallmouth fishery in the world. There just ain't no arguing it right now. Uh, Sturgeon Bay was really good. That kind of went downhill in the Great Lakes. I mean – you're dealing with eight and ten foot waves some days, and it's it's really not that much fun out there. Malax is it's a pond full of six pound smallmouths that are pretty easy to catch. Uh, Sean asks thoughts on spin shot style hooks. Um, I I is that when it swings around. That yeah, the okay. BMC makes a spin shot. Um, mm -hmm. I typically use the regular sure set hooks. And uh, they're they're probably nice if you use straight fluorocarbon. It definitely will cut down a little bit on line twist. But using the braid to the fluorocarbon leader, uh, braid can handle line twist like a hundred times better than fluorocarbon can. So I typically just use the regular sure set hooks. But 
I do too. I, I tried it one time. Uh, this one you got to tie the le- the bottom of the drop leader onto, right? Yeah. And when I we got a lot of zebra mussels here, so uh, but it definitely if you're using straight floral carbon, it'd be something to look at. Um, but yeah, I'm the same. I I use a I use a regular hook. Uh, what? Wait, hold on. Where are we? So, how long of a floral carbon leader are you running? above the bait to the yellow braid yeah well i used to just tie like a six or seven foot leader total in length including the drop leader and that's realistically all you need but i started running a longer leader the last couple of years and it does a lot for me um especially in areas where you're retying a lot um the fact that you have to tie a leader for your drop your weight um it actually eats up a lot of line tying it and another thing, like I was saying, when you're dropping vertically on fish, floral carbon comes off your reel a lot easier than braid does. So now I've honestly been running uh, probably close to 20-foot leaders, just reeling them right into my reel. When I'm smallmouth fishing, it uh, does a few things for me. Like I said, when I'm straight over fish dropping to it, my bait goes down a lot faster. And then when I am fishing vertically, I don't, I don't need that lack of stretch. I actually kind of want some stretch, so I'm able to – take advantage take advantage of the stretch of my floral carbon and at the same time if i make a long cast and hook one out there then i got you know 40 foot of braid to it where uh you know it's taking a lot of that stretch other we're gonna get a good hook set on a long cast or if i'm fishing vertically i can take advantage of the stretch that i do need to keep them fish pegged on that little hook and it's nice too when you are breaking off leaders yeah stuff, it'll you save you some off, time you, you can get you know four or five six reties out of a 25 20 foot leader whereas a you know, six, seven foot leader, you get one retie and then you're tying on a new leader. So definitely save you a little time there too. Uh, what weight do you guys use most? I, I, I know mine. I use a three ace a whole bunch. Yeah. Uh, it's, but it's, I like it's half ounce. If, I, if I'm smallmouth fishing, it's yeah. like half ounce all the time, no matter Especially what. Especially if you're vertical. <laughs> if they're right there, you want it to get down like that. Yeah. I mean, they're curious. I think they like it falling really mm-hmm. fast. Um, and you're fishing deep water, waves, all that stuff kind of keeps it to you. There's, there's very few times where I use a really light drop shot sinker anymore. Probably, probably rarely go less than a quarter anymore. But, uh, if I'm fishing shallow, pitching around some large mouse and stuff, so I'll, I'll run more of that quarter and three eighths. But small mouse, even if they're in two feet or 50 feet, I'm using a half ounce weight. Absolutely. Keep it on the bottom. That's the point. Plus, you're able to play with it, give it more action without lifting that bait up off the bottom. Um, is there ever a time that you will not use high vis braid for your main line? Not really. I have no problem with that. I, I think it benefits yeah, me. Only a bunch. like with a bait caster if I'm flipping grass. Right. Absolutely. You know, then I'm going to use the the moss green color or whatever you want to call it. But if I'm tying a leader to it, it's as bright as I can get it. I, I want to be able to see that line twitch, see it move. I mean, there's I don't with when you're running a big long leader, I don't see any advantage to running a a, a moss green braid. No, or you a, definitely a want to be able braid. to see that line, what it's doing at all times. Uh, what issues could using copolymer cause with drop shots instead of fluoro? You're going to have some stretch. You're going to have a little more, more stretch. You're going to pull out a fluoro. Um, I don't think copolymer sinks, but a drop, I mean. No, it's probably going to float a little bit. Um, I, you know, I don't know about tying the knot. I don't know about the knot. Might, and and the diameter is probably going to be a yeah. little thick for uh, what you what you want to do. I, I, I don't see. I haven't tried it, use, so I don't know that I could tell you the disadvantage. But I just yeah, uh, fluorocarbon is just what I use. It's yeah. more sensitive for a lot of a lot of right reasons. And uh, I, 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 I I you'll catch some fish on copolymer. Don't get me wrong. You'll you'll catch plenty. You'll catch more on floral. Yeah. If you can make a trip. Sean asked if you can make a trip anywhere in the country in February, where would it be? Uh, Florida. I'm definitely going to say Florida. Pretty much Florida. (laughs) You're starting at late February. You're probably starting to get where it's pretty good. Other places, you know, uh, Texas, Alabama, stuff like that. Especially January and early February, Florida is the place to be. It's 80 degrees. It's prime time. I mean, I'm so polar. It's like I like Florida in January and February big sticks and braid and and then i like going up in july august and get on that big water with the spinning pole and and that's that's the deal that's where i'd like to be all i know is i like flip-flops on it all the time if i can what other hey guys what other applications would you say you use drop shot on 
a lot other than bed fishing, weed limes, pumps, almost anywhere, literally. Yeah, you can throw it anywhere, anywhere but if you're smallmouth fishing, it, it just has to be on the deck, uh, no doubt about it. And, and it does shine and when largemouth fishing gets tough, you know, if you stop catching them on spinner baits and crank baits and jigs and stuff that it, it, it's just a, it's something you're going to use when fishing's tough. You know, it gets you a lot more bites than any other thing else will. Um, so anytime you want to catch more fish or the bites really off and, you know, just catching a few fish is really good. That drop shot's going to shine. Um, and yeah, like I said, anytime you're smallmouth fishing, it's it's pretty much the number one. Yeah, I can tell you, you know, in all of my fishing, I, 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 you know, even in Florida, I still have a drop shot in my deck, in my in, underneath my compartment somewhere. I 100% always have a drop shot around somewhere. 75% of the time, it's on the deck, and then there's sometimes that I could have three or four of them on the deck, depending you know, on what I'm doing. But uh, really, you can use it anywhere, no doubt about it. <clears throat> How do you set the drag on six to eight pound test? I get this in here now. Um, well, well, especially when I'm using that little nose hook, that little sure set, um, I'll actually keep my drag a little bit tighter when I set the hook. And then once, once you got a good, I mean, honestly, a lot of your hook set on that really finessey stuff is made when the fish makes that first good run. Like, you'll lift on him and start whining, and he'll be running at you. Then I mean, as soon as he turns and gets loaded up, <clears throat> that's actually when you get a lot a lot of your hook penetration. So after that point, I'll crank my drag way loose and just let that fish swim. You're, it's open water. You're, there's nothing he's going to get into. Just take your time with him. Uh, back the drag way off, and if he wants to go, let him go, and just tire him out so you can get your hand under his belly. So uh, I set it a little tighter when I'm fishing. Then I set the hook and get that – hook penetrate good i'll actually back that drag way off to almost nothing and just let them swim <clears throat> uh, another thing um when you're fighting fish on that little especially smallmouth on that little nose hook bait i see a lot of guys make a mistake where a fish wants to come and jump especially a smallmouth they love jumping it's just in their nature um the guys want to like they're fishing with a big bait cast or something and a stiff rod like when the fish goes to try to jump they want to put the rod down and try to keep that fish from jumping and that, that puts that hook on a lot of pressure when you do that. So one thing I've learned, um, I just let them jump. Just, uh, if they're coming up jumping, I just keep reeling and just let them jump and go right back down. If you try to keep them down, when they're going to jump, you'll lose a lot of fish that way. Um, that little hook's sharp, and it doesn't take much but a little tiny piece of skin to hold them fish on there. So I, I let the smallmouth jump on that little nose hook. I don't try to stop them. You ain't going to stop them with a little seven foot medium light rod anyways and their big small mouths are going wherever they want so just let them go don't try to don't try to keep them down um i see a lot of guys make that mistake and lose fish on that little nose hook no no he actually corrected me on that i was having a problem with it where uh they'd come up my instinct was to try to go low with the rod and i, I was, I was fish were just pulling off and it's a big bad fish he ain't doing nothing with that fish and Honestly, as soon as I just kept that real moving, heck, they're giving you real estate. Take it. If they're going to jump up there, just keep that line tight and keep bringing them to the boat, and uh, they'll, they'll stay on. They'll stay on so much better than if you start letting go and start letting them do their thing when they're in the air. Um, let's see. Yeah, this one here, Jesus. Oh, no, this is funny. Is there any way – is that the way I'm up? Yeah. Is there any way that you know how to – or know of to skip a drop shot under docks? Maybe a short leader. Yeah, you definitely want to fish a shorter leader to make your bait a little more compact. That's where I like going to that round sinker, too, that makes your bait a little shorter. Uh, it doesn't skip very great, just the fact you're – it's like trying to skip a Carolina rig or something. you got two pieces that it's just not going to fly very well. So, I mean, just a real low underhand pitch is about the best you can do with a drop shot. It's not going to skip great, but, yeah, shortening up your leader and going to a round ball sinker is going to definitely help just make that package a little more compact. Um, yeah, a lot of pitching, a lot of pitching and skipping too, just more pitching. It yeah. Uh, when will Seth's hair jig rod be available? Steve's or other, other Daiwa line of rods, seven, six. Oh, uh, there is a seven, six yeah, coming it's, out. It's a uh, medium, medium light. It's, is it available in the Steve's yet? Okay. But it, it, they got one possibly coming out in the Steve's AGS, which is a beautiful rod. And then they also have a new line of rods coming out next year, Classic. 
sometimes next sometime next year will also be available in that line too. And I'll I'll tell you too though, I I, I threw around a bunch of the seven foot medium lights to use with the AGS yeah. guys. And I'm telling you, you gotta remember That's a lot nice of times. One. I mean, if you're towing, you know, you can't do that all the time to determine competition. I like that longer rod, but for like casting and just reeling it in across the right reefs and stuff. That thing's a beaut. It'll cast. It'll cast with the right line yeah. line combination. That thing will cast at a mile. Yeah, and that's a good. That's a damn good rod. That, that's that's what I've been using as a seven foot medium light. But we do have a seven six uh, medium medium light coming out, which is actually a really awesome rod. Uh, what situation would you tie on a twenty foot leader versus say a three to five foot? Um. That 20-foot leader, that's kind of a spinning pole thing for me. For sure. Um, if I'm going to do that flip shot, sometimes I'll, especially fishing heavy grass, I'll do braid to a fluorocarbon leader. At that point, I do not like that knot going into my reel. Um, then I will tie a shorter leader. But uh, with the spinning rod stuff, uh, especially fishing in deep water, I've been running a long leader. It's just it, it's, it's more efficient. You're going to save a lot more time retying and stuff with a long leader. Uh, what – this one was opposite towards me. What baits are you using for the first Central Open in Louisiana? I don't know. I don't even know how to pronounce the name of the lake that I'm going to. Oh, up to Chilada. I'm going to throw a spinner bug there. I, I guarantee bit. you the BioVex stand gun will be out there, and, and I'm happy in February in Louisiana if I'm flipping wood and stuff like that. I'm going to be very much so happy. I might even – a little flip shot action might be kind of good too when the pressure gets to them. So, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. I've been there. I'm guessing Squareville. Probably be pretty good. Chatterbug, spinnerbug, and flipping. Should cover most of it. Uh, you guys coming to Toledo Bend in May of 2016? What will it take to win? Ooh, it's a good question. I'm by no means a Toledo Bend expert, but it's definitely one of the best bass fisheries in the world right now. So um I'd, I'd definitely say i don't know somewhere between 20 and 25 pounds a day to win the thing maybe maybe more but i can't see it taking any less than 20 pounds a day uh rob good question for flip shotting do you shorten or lengthen up your leader compared to drop shotting have you ever drop shotted in shallow or stained water and if so have you you have good results um but for both those i generally like a little bit of a shallow or a uh, shorter uh leader um, for my flip shot, a lot of times yeah. I'm still using a shorter leader. You're talking like maybe six inches. Yeah. Something like it's that. kind of the same deal trying to fish underneath the dock as it is like throwing in a big lay down. If you try flipping a long leader, you're just going to end up wrapping around all the branches. So, um, yeah, six to 12 inch leader. Um, keep it real short, more compact. You can fit it in spots tighter. And, uh, yeah, definitely the, the water clarity doesn't seem to be an issue. And I, I like fishing it shallow too. If you know there's some fish around some stumps and two feet of water and you can't get them to bite that, that flip shot's a great way to catch them. Yeah. And with the stained water deal, sometimes you, again, you want to go with a little bit shorter leader. Sometimes if, if they're, if they are hogging the bottom, because it's, this is more so, I, I'm going to say it's more so it's, not stained water they're used to but when the water changes on them and all of a sudden gets get stained then a lot of times they're going to hug boulders they're going to get down they're going to get tight and sometimes that shorter leader if that's where they're at that's where they're at um no swivels anymore what kind of knot to the hook oh uh, yeah no swivels um the braid kind of eliminated the need for a swivel like i said it'll handle line twist like you can hook that thing to a drill and screw on it It'll, you can still fish it just and when fine. you get that knot done one knot's better than two yeah you know? and the knot to the hook's a, a san diego jam for me now um really great knot with light fluorocarbon um and like i said it won't it won't allow that knot to fold down like if you're pitching a uh especially the heavy sinkers those heavy sinkers for smallmouth fishing half ounce or whatever and you're pitching just a, with a regular polymer knot it'll actually pull that knot through oh that reminds me there's a couple other tips i want to tell you when you are tying up a drop shot, just going back to kind of beginner stuff, um, after you tie your San Diego jam, run your tag end back through the top of your hook. That'll allow your hook to stick out horizontal and keep your bait in a more natural position. And another little tip, at the bottom of your drop leader where you're hooking your weight to, one single, and depending on how heavy a line you're using, eight pound and up, you can basically get by with one overhand knot. Anything less than that, I do two overhand knots on top of each other just to make it a bigger knot and uh, seat the, the clip from your drop shot weight on the inside of that knot. That'll keep a lot of you, 
a lot of times fish will jump and throw your weight or uh, you get kind of hung up and your weight will come off. Um, that'll save you a lot of sinkers, just tying that Big little time. overhand knot at the end of your, uh, the end of your drop leader. Uh, can you describe putting movement on the bait retrieve speed? Uh, you know, that, again, that varies on what the fish are doing so much of the time. Sometimes they want that thing just dead stick, not moving. Um, sometimes it's as simple as drop, pick it back up. A lot of times you're dragging, if you're casting out there, you're just kind of dragging over, feeling each rock, each, everything you have there. And a lot of times, like for smallmouth in particular, if I'm fishing a big reef, I'm going to drag that thing, drag it. As soon as I feel where it's kind of getting sticky and nasty and that's the spot, that's where I'll kill it. And boom, that's where that fish is going to come from because you know, you're, you're starting to find that boulder, you're getting snuck up in that kind of that deal. Um, so yeah. And for me, retrieve speed, uh, I'm really not trying to cover a lot of water when I'm drop shot and I'm, I'm throwing it pretty much where I think a fish is. Um, I, you know, it, it might look like I'm fishing fairly fast, but, um, I'm not going to really drag that bait more than a few feet at most. So trying to keep that sinker in place and, uh, there's kind of a feel to it. You get, it's all about shaking your slack. You never really want to lift up on that sinker. You're just kind of jiggling the loose line between your sinker and your bait, making that worm dance um, without moving your sinker, without pulling that bait away from the fish. Um, that's kind of the key to drop shot and why it is so effective. You can keep your bait in the same spot and move it, and you can't really do that with any other style lure. Uh, this is a one towards you being in the elites do you normally talk about what you're doing with your marshal oh yeah for sure uh i'd much rather have a marshal than a co-angler um like i fished opens and stuff before with co-anglers and um i'm not really gonna go out of my way to really tell them anything i mean you can it's a competition yeah with, with, with a marshal i mean i'll i'll give you the whole rundown on everything i'm doing everything i know anyways it might not be the best thing to be doing but uh what i'm doing yeah i, I like the marshals it's it's a lot more friendly uh, in the boat than with a co-angler for sure you ain't worried about them sniping yeah. behind you yeah uh what size weight do you use for flip shotting um i use like a three eighths and a half a three bunch eighths and half, around yeah. grass and stuff and then that when i was talking about that heavy flip shotting that i was doing you know, i was fishing over like 30 feet of water or something like that dropping it down to them i think i was using like a three quarter same deal. I just wanted the bait to get down there right now, you know. Uh, what size and type of worm do you wacky rig for largemouth and smallmouth? I like a Senko. Yeah. A bunch. Senko's um, good. You can get by with generic ones too, fishing them on a drop shot. You don't have the big fall that you do out of a um, just a wacky rig Senko. Um, so that style bait. Uh, smallmouth, three and four inch, largemouth, four to. I had good luck fishing Kentucky Lake, fishing a big drop shot on a bait caster with a wacky rig six inch Senko. Um, and I suppose seven inches would be good too, depending on the size of the fish you're fishing around. Um, but yeah, most, most of the stuff we use for smallmouths, two and a half to four inches, and most of the largemouth stuff's uh, well, four to eight inches, I suppose, four to seven inches. In case Dave missed the, what was the Daiwa on your Daiwa worm? that you were uh, uh it's a Daiwa nico worm real cool new worm out got a ton of action ton of great colors and actually some awesome scent on it why is nobody using circle her hooks i've been using them for two years now and have not lost a fish since really for two years not one if it works for you keep using That's that why i can't argue with that yeah. i lost a whole bunch of them last year so yeah um, I, I never had good luck with circle hooks man i guess you gotta set the hook a lot different too it's just not my nature but yeah i mean hook hook is hooks are all preference if you got something where you're landing 95 to 100 percent of your fish on stick with it man um, I've played with a bunch of different hooks and those are the ones that work the best for me. You know, both those hooks for me are, you know, 99% land ratio hooks. And if you got that in a hook, stick with it. You don't got to change for no reason. If you ain't losing nothing, stay with it. Yeah, same with, same with line, same with not, same with everything. I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, these are just, these are just, uh, these are just what we're using. And, and a lot of it's been through trial and error and stuff like that, that we, that we used in the first place. Um, uh, is drop shotting? Oh, hold on a second. Talk more about drop shotting on Lake like Douglas, deep highland lakes. 
Well, yeah, I mean, Douglas, you know, those Highland Lakes, a lot of them got ledges and stuff like that. Brush um, piles. Brush piles, a big one. Finding them brush piles. and that, yeah. That's kind of where more where I'll use that straight shank hook, Texas rigged with a straight tail worm. And I'll just get right over the top of them brush piles and dropping in on them. Yeah, and same deal. Sometimes, you know, those those rev, those reservoirs, if they're not pulling water, those fish ain't eating. You know, that's when they eat. So they're still there. It can be some of the times the most gross for a guy like me that loves electronics. I can literally know I'm sitting over a Bass Pro Shops tank of fish underneath me, and I just cannot get one to bite. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times they're used to seeing the big crankbait coming whipping through and the big worm and stuff. And sometimes you got to go to that drop shot to get them to bite. But once they bite, that's a lot of times when then I can go back and revert back to a power fishing technique and, and, and uh, start landing fish a lot faster and a lot quicker. But, uh, again, same deal. You know, they're shad orientated. You want to get something in their face if you're seeing them down there and then try to trigger one into biting. So that's that's where using that brush piles are obviously a big one. Bridge pilings, any of that kind of stuff, you're still using drop. And and mind you too, I mean, it ain't nothing for me to just be fishing along and all of a sudden see just an echo go underneath my boat and grab my drop shot and just drop down there and catch that fish. I don't always know I'm going to catch a fish on a drop shot. I might not make a cast with it certain days, and then some days it ends up, I end up winning my biggest fish or my fifth fish. And you know, you fish in like the opens and preset the elites and guys that fish the tour any, anywhere. I mean, you're talking a lot of boats come in there and there's a lot of pressure, long practices, and those fish get conditioned pretty quick. So uh, the drop shot is just a tournament fishing made the drop shot famous and you can really do it, do it in, anywhere. So uh, Highland Reservoir, Reservoir, same, same deal. Is drop shotting, Joe's asking, is drop shotting limited to smaller size baits or can you use something larger than a six inch worm, like an eight to ten inches worm? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You can put, there ain't nothing you can't put on a drop shot. And especially if you're on some of them ledge lakes or full of, you know, four plus pound bass, I mean, I, you could drop shot one of them giant custom poured 17 inch worms or whatever like, yeah, they just make are. sure you got the hook for your conditions and what yeah, you're doing yeah, match the hook to match it your setup accordingly to what you got going on out there and uh yeah absolutely uh, and remember too bigger bait's going to slow your fall so a lot of times depending on what you're trying to accomplish if you go with a real big bait you might need to bump up your weight size if you want it to get down to the bottom if for whatever reason they're liking that slow flut flutter down you know you can get that out of that bigger bait uh that's a good question when should i fish a jig worm instead that's a good one seth uh, <laughs> answer it a, a jig worm for let me, me take like it, let a, me get a, we have a notebook Go ahead. a jig worm for me is kind of more of a dead stick and bait uh um it definitely there's a lot of spots you can throw a drop shot on the jig worm right next to each other and both will definitely produce um but yeah just a little different technique you know any of them spots that are you know, I consider good jig worm spots. You could definitely fish a drop shot in. Um, and we do. We fish both of them right next to each other and just mix it up. You know, you catch a few, a handful on a drop shot and a handful on a, a jig worm. You, you just, every fish ain't going to bite the same bait. You know, you got to gotta mix it up on them. Absolutely. And, and again, jig worm isn't exactly giving the same presentation that a drop shot. Drop Don't shot know. is giving you that that weightless presentation and jig worm still got some weight on it so uh, jig worms a, for me a dead stick and bait is really what it is i throw it in a spot where i'm very confident there's a bass sitting and i just let her sit till she swims off uh when is your next trip to falcon or amistad i don't know i i love both those lakes but there's nothing on the schedule this year and i don't even think i'm anywhere even near them so probably yeah. not this year yeah not for me uh when can you get the dye with soft plastics? Soon. Uh, dye with soft plastics are coming soon. This is the best answer I can give you. <laughs> Just tried the Tatsu line for flipping this year, and that stuff is the – cool. Keep trying it out, man. Uh, if you had one bay to fish on Minnetonka, which would it be? You know what? I can tell you, I, I can't answer that question. Um, I can tell you a couple I don't want to fish, but outside of that, uh, yeah, there's some bad I like ones. them all, man. It just totally depends on what they're doing. You know, any guide trip, any tournament out there, sometimes they're doing something on the clear side, on the dirty side, or whatever. It's just uh, – Be honest with you, the and a lot of it has to do with the tournaments we have out there, but uh, day in and day out, Crystal Bay is probably the – 
the most consistent bait on the whole There's lake. Some big ones of crystal too. Well, my, all our fish are getting let go from them tournaments swimming to Crystal Bay. So, other all, all the other bays have their moments, but day in and day out, Crystal Bay is probably the most consistent. As a, uh, I wish FLW would have a Marshall program at least to maybe fill open boats. Right on, Johnny. We're following you, but being able to win some money is the deal, also for co anglers. Yeah, yeah, you can see both sides of it. Yeah, if you want to be a co or if you're a co angler, FLW is the place for you. If you want a marshal, uh, they definitely got some room on the Elite Series for a few guys, and it's honestly a really great deal. You get to fish, you know, three or four days with the best fishermen in the world for next to nothing. I mean, it's awesome learning experience, guide trip type deal. You just you don't get to catch any of them, kind of sucks. I mean, what, yeah, but what other sport? I mean, what other sport can you do that? Yeah, you, you, can't you, go, you can't go play a game of horse with LeBron James. No, and you, you ain't jumping in the car with Earnhardt Jr. No. either. Best flipping jig color and trailer for Tonka. The questions are coming. Uh, that's seasonal for me. Totally seasonal. Uh, I mean. I still like my greens a lot. Magic Cross, pretty good, good in the one. summer. In the fall, I throw a little different color. but And you can't, black and blue gets bit out there all the yeah, time. Yeah, if you're, if you're in the dirty water, black and blue is pretty strong. But uh, over the last couple of years, that Magic Cross probably been the best color out there. Johnny's asking, what are some good – this is a good question, too. What are some good drop shot baits uh, to bass eating crawfish? Also, if they're eating crawfish, should I shorten the leader? Uh, not necessarily. I, crawfish can swim – can get up pretty high. I mean, we throw that little fly around or a little hair jig around, and uh, yeah. sometimes I think, Especially think for those are – Smallmouth, they just like going up, man. They They're really do. Way more than going down. A smallie um, beaver is a really good um, – Yeah, and I've actually had good luck with a small, like, two-and-a-half-inch tube on a drop shot. That I've diable had really one you introduced me to is that rattling hog or yep. whatever, whatever it's called. Yep. Rattling hog, that, that's a small bait. Got a little rattle. Kind of really unique bait for, for that kind of deal. But uh, – Definitely uh, a little beaver. I've done well with that little smallie beaver, yep. stuff like that when, when that's the deal. Uh, we got, we're going to take just a couple more questions, and we got Cutter Shy. We're, uh, we're starting to get into them. Uh, they're coming, though. I lose a lot of weights. This is Jim. I lose a lot of weights around rocks, like on Vermilion. What's the best type of weight to use when you're fishing a rocky a cylinder weight? Uh, cylinder weight for sure, but Vermilion's got that shield rock. Yep um the crevices in the shield rock there's just you're gonna go through weights it's like eerie you're gonna lose weight yeah there, ain't, a bunch of there ain't no one in there but the cylinder will go through a lot more stuff than the round ball will it's a kind of a give and take you know you know in a lot of those types of situations you don't need a million other pieces of tackle but man you know a lot of drop shot stuff because yeah. uh, it's just a part of the beast uh yes uh dario's asking me are you exclusively using 200 kilohertz for video game fishing do you ever use a i don't i'm, I'm all 200 i i have not switched that when it comes to my traditional sonar that's what i'm using um why i don't know if i can really tell you i just use 200 that's uh that's the one i use it's kind of what they're all programmed around for most freshwater fishing uh you basically stick with their 200 um do you ever tie they must have jumped down late sure. do you ever tie straight to oh oh no oh yeah i see what you're saying uh straight braid and no floral um super heavy vegetation you know flipping some thick milk well even that i still i'll either go straight floral or uh, a leader but uh yeah definitely and um uh, yeah on. thick heavy vegetation typically shallow or um i will use straight braid and again, that heavy, that one I was showing you, that heavy flip shot. I mean, I, I was down fishing for, you know, Falcon and Amistad bass when them lakes were in their prime, those South, Florida, those South Texas lakes. Uh, you know, you just need a braid to get them away from it because they're heavy. You know, you set the hook and they pin you to the bottom. And I'm not the biggest guy in the world, but I generally don't have a problem with fish, but I had a few of them actually bend my arms down, which is a little bit embarrassing. So braid was definitely nice to get them up and get them out of that foundation before I could break them out. And, and that was coming from a guy that really preferred to use prefer, prefers to use fluorocarbon whenever I can. So um, there I was using straight braid. Uh, like the new webinar setup, guys. Seth should be seeing you down in Mountain Home in April for the Elite event. What's that? Mm -hmm. What does it say? In what? Mountain Home. 
Oh, Mount Hump in April for the That's where Mass Cats are built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for another great discussion, guys. Thank you. We do appreciate it. We're sorry if this one was a little bit choppy with uh, some stuff. We'll try to figure out a better way to fine fine tune this. But please, 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 please keep coming on. And, yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. We, we appreciate get, it. We want to thank everybody for coming. The next one's on swim baits. Should be a coming good up one. really quick. Huh? January fifth, eight o'clock p.m. Central. I may or may not have my tooth fixed by then. <laughs> Stay I'm tuned. Gonna, I'm gonna guess with no. I'm gonna go no. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Tight lines for those that can fish. That's it.